Okay. Um, this is, I'm putting this in every one of these, so you've got a general overview. The author, Luke, the Gentile companion of Paul, the only Gentile writer of any part of the Bible. Um, we believe that it was written about 30 years or so after the death, and resur death resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. Um, the purpose is to show the Old Testament promises of God are fulfilled all the way through here. All of these sermons, you've been seeing that. Whether it be Philip or Peter or Stephen or Paul, uh, as, as we begin into Paul's sermons now, all of them refer to the Old Testament promises of God and how Jesus is the fulfillment of that. That really is the theme, and that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, the fulfillment of the Jewish promise, but that promise also was that all other peoples would be blessed through the Jews. That was the promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, through Moses, everybody else, all the way along the line. And again, we've talked about, there's three sort of broad ways you can look at this, the witness in Jerusalem, and then the witness in Judea and Samaria, that is the, the Jewish areas around um, Jerusalem, and then just beyond that, and then the ends of the earth. But there's, a, there's different ways you can do it. Now, I want to start out the lecture with this map, which you have seen before. Um, we've already talked about the first missionary journey. Paul and Barnabas are located here in Antioch. The first missionary journey, journey are these, this blue line. They went to the island of Cyprus, crossed over. Then they went up here to uh, Italia, which is, this is all what was then called Asia Minor, this lump of land, which we now know of as Turkey. From there, uh, Italia, Perga was the port. They went inland to Antioch in Pisidia, or Antioch of Pisidia. That is to differentiate it from Antioch of Syria, this Antioch, which was a ma the major city. It's the third biggest city in the Roman Empire. And then uh, from there to Iconium, to Lystra, and to Derby, and then back again. Okay? That first missionary journey has just completed as we are picking up here. Today we're going to be talking about one of the most important events in the uh, history of the early church, it, I guess I would probably say, in the book of Acts at least, setting aside the, the resurrection and ascension of Jesus as the ultimate act, probably the coming of the Holy Spirit in the second chapter of Acts is the only event more important than what we're going to look at in Acts 15. Acts 15 is the Jerusalem Council. The whole future of the church is decided at the Council in Jerusalem, and we're going to talk about that and why that is a major turning point in the book of Acts and in the life and history of the whole church. Okay? Now, to give you, I want to give you a little bit of perspective. This Jerusalem Council happened in A.D. 48. Jesus' resurrection was in 30 to 33, depending upon you know, which scholar you're looking at. So we're talking about 15 to 18 years after Jesus. His death, his death, resurrection, and ascension. So approximately 15 years later. Now to give you a perspective, AD 39 was when we believe Cornelius, the first Gentile convert, Cornelius and his household, under the teaching of Peter, become Christians. So that's eight years before the Jerusalem Council. Cornelius, the first Gentile Christian in his household, his family. Then the year after Cornelius in AD 40, we had the first Gentiles converted in Antioch, Antioch of Syria, which is here, okay, right there. And that became that the church in Antioch was predominantly Gentile, it may have had some Jewish members, but that Gentile church in Antioch is, is sort of the, the point around which all of the Council of Jerusalem is centered. We'll talk about that. Then the first missionary journey, which we just mentioned, which was here, the blue line, that was in A.D. 46 and 47. So around A.D. 47, while Paul and Barnabas were just getting back from this trip, we have some people approaching uh, this, the church in Antioch, the Gentile believers in Antioch, from Jerusalem. They were Jewish Pharisees who were Christian believers, and they brought a particular idea that these Gentile believers have to become Jews in order to be Christians. That they could not be saved without being circumcised and without obeying the Jewish law. Not eating bacon or shellfish, etc., etc. Okay? We're going to get into that today, but I wanted to let you know that, give you kind of a scale of the, the involvement of Gentiles prior to that. Again, Cornelius, the first Gentile convert, was probably eight years before this. 
The first convert, Gentile converts in the Church of Antioch were seven years before this. So all along, either those like Cornelius and the male members of his family and the early converts in Antioch, either they were they were already becoming Jews, in other words, they were being circumcised so that nobody had a problem, or else it had not arisen, nobody had had any heartburn about this, and so they'd not worried about it until this time. We're not sure exactly which one of those things is true, okay? But it, there is a gap between the first Gentile converts and when a problem arises about the Gentile converts. But most scholars think it's probably likely that Cornelius and others went ahead and got circumcised because they hadn't really worked out the issue until that point, all right? Now, one other thing I want to mention from this map, you will notice that up here in the north, I'm sure you can all see that from back there, but right here, these red letters, it says Galatia, right? The area of Asia Minor, this large body of land that we now, this giant peninsula that sticks out into the Aegean, between the Black Sea, the Aegean Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, which we know of as Turkey, um, originally, there were various provinces and various groups of people who had lived there. One of the provinces were the Galatians. And the people of Galatia, some of them had traveled all the way across Europe and settled in Western Europe in an area called Gaul. You've heard of Gaul? You've got a lot of Gaul. Um, what do we know of as Gaul? What is Gaul today? France. It's France. The Gauls were the French. And so, I mean, it may have overlapped into Germany as well, but predominantly, the, you know, Gaul was, was the, is, is French. It's called Gaul because the people who settled there were from Galatia, and it's up here in the north. Well, you notice here's where the churches are that Paul and Barnabas planted in their first missionary journey. Now, there are, the book of Galatians is widely believed to be the first book written in the New Testament. That is Paul's letter to the churches of Galatia. But there is a a scholarly argument about where those churches were, and there's a reason. This, historically, had been the province of Galatia up here. This is Cappadocia, this is um, uh, Mysia, this is uh, Lyconia, Pisidia, they all, there are all these different areas. This was Galatia. But the churches that Paul um, planted, Paul and Barnabas, in their first missionary journey would have been in Lyconium by the old record. But the problem is, when the Romans conquered this whole, well, the whole world, pretty much the whole known world at that point, they reorganized provinces based upon what was the, how they were going to manage it, where they were going to have a center of government and how, well, how much property they could manage. This actually, th this area right here, is that same map. This is Asia Minor. This is Turkey. You know, this is this is Greece, Italy. You recognize Spain, Portugal, uh, France, Germany, etc. You will notice that this red area, which is the Roman province of Galatia, comes much further south. The controversy is, when Paul says the Gal churches in Galatia, he doesn't name the churches or where they are. There's a northern Galatia theory, which proposes that Paul planted churches in his second missionary journey, which he, he let, the second missionary journey, he went overland. He went this way. You'll notice he's up here. Some people believe he sort of swung out into Galatia and planted some churches there the second trip through here. I don't think that's right. I think that Paul was not, when he says the churches of Galatia, he's not referring to the ancient province of Galatia, but to the Roman province of Galatia. Remember, he's a Roman citizen. And that would have included these churches. It also makes sense because the very problem that we're going to be talking about in the Council of Jerusalem, the circumcision of Gentiles, is, a, is exactly the problem they were having in the churches in Galatia. That's why Paul wrote that letter. Because there were Judaizers, those who advocated that they had to follow the Jewish faith to be Christians, they were troubling the Galatians. And the thing is, if Paul wrote this, the question is, did he write it early to these churches that he planted in his first missionary journey, or did he write it later to churches that he might have planted up here but we don't know about? If he wrote it later, then why would he have not said the council in Jerusalem has already decided this issue, you don't have to be circumcised? He never says that in the, in the book of Galatians, which is the biggest reason I think it was written earlier. Now, that does make a difference in terms of what we're going to look at today. You need to know the Southern Galatian theory believes that these are the churches the book of Galatians were written to about the issue of circumcision. The Northern Galatian theory, which fewer people hold now, it used to be that people thought this, is that... 
we don't know when, and well, we think the second missionary endured, but we don't know the churches, but Paul may have planted northern churches and wrote to them later. That makes a difference as to whether Galatians is the first book written in the New Testament or not. If it's not Galatians, it's probably, well, James is probably the first book of the New Testament, but the first of Paul's letters. Okay, now let's, let's get into the text and talk about all of this, but I needed to give you that background. From Acts 15, starting with the first verse. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem. Notice it's always up to Jerusalem, whether you're headed south or north or whatever. To go up to Jerusalem and see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, the coastal areas the, the, between Syria and Judea, um, Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, these are Jewish Christians who had been part of the Pharisee sect, meaning very uh, conservative, very rigid. The Pharisee, the Pharisee means separated ones because they saw themselves as being different than everybody else because they were being true to the law. Okay. Those who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. Now this issue, this same issue of do Gentiles have to be circumcised and then obey the law of Moses is exactly what Paul is writing to the churches of Galatia about in the book of Galatians. In fact, in the second chapter of Galatians, he talks about exactly this issue. He talks about the Judaizers, is the term that's often used for them later on. The, the technical theological word, were, they were called Ebionites. The Ebionite heresy were those that thought you had to follow, you had to become Jewish in order to be Christian. Okay? Now, in fact, we get more detail in the second chapter of Galatians about this than we get right here. Apparently, when these Judaizers had come up to Antioch, and they had, and again, Paul and Barnabas were probably not back yet when this is happening, or they would have nipped this thing in the bud. By the time Paul and Barnabas get back from the first missionary journey, these guys have already got the church in a turmoil in Antioch because they told them, you have to be circumcised. You will remember we talked about the fact that throughout the, the, uh, the Greek world, there were Gentiles... There were Gentiles who were um, wanting to believe in monotheism. They wanted to believe in one God. Guys, could you not talk? Or go outside if you're going to talk, because I can hear you, so I know the people around you can hear you. Um, the, the, there were God-fearing Gentiles who wanted to believe in one God, but the only way they could do it was by becoming a Jew. Like Cornelius? That, well, Cornelius was a God-fearing Gentile. He's described as that. But these Gentiles were reluctant to become Jewish, because if they became Jewish, especially if they were adult men, that meant being circumcised and not being able to eat bacon. You know, two really big deals. Um, and so they were reluctant to do that. Christianity comes along and says you can become a, a believer in one God without having to become a Jew. Well, now these guys have come along to Antioch, these Judaizers, these Pharisees, and say, no, you do have to be circumcised. You do have to follow the law. And it becomes a big deal. In fact, in Galatians 2, the... Uh, discussion that Paul gives us there is that they were so adamant about this that even Peter and even Barnabas started buying into this. They had Peter, who was responsible for the first Gentile conversions, Peter who had the vision of all things being clean and the voice of God saying, don't call anything unclean that I say is clean. Um, Peter, uh, Paul accuses him and says, Peter, you are saying you'll no longer eat with Gentiles. So you're not following the Jewish law strictly, and yet you, you're not going to eat with them because they're not following the law? You're being a hypocrite. And Paul called, says that to him. And, he, and then it says Barnabas even fell into this. Well, Paul, in Galatians 2, he tells us, he smacked Peter around, straightened him out. Peter realized he had been wrong about this, and he, he went back to what he had thought before. And by the time we have this event happening, which is later, when Peter comes down with Paul and Barnabas, he, he shows up, whether it comes directly from there or not, um, he has gone back to what he believed originally, and that is that Gentiles can become Christians without being circumcised. 
Okay? But this was a big deal and it was creating huge havoc. Now, yes, ma'am? Did they always lump those two items of circumcision and the loss of Moses together? Or did they not say, as long as you agree to abide by the laws of Moses, then. No. Circumcision is the mark of being Jewish. Circumcision was presented to Abraham as being a mark on the physical body of all male Jews. So that you literally carry on your body a sign of the fact that you were committed to the covenant. So circumcision, in fact... Oh, the commitment to the covenant the, there. Well, to the, to the Sabbath. The two big marks, the thing that differentiated Jews from everybody else, was circumcision for all males and obeying the Sabbath. The Sabbath being part of the law. I mean, it's one of the Ten Commandments. But in terms of the world looking at people and being able to recognize they were Jewish, Obviously, you wouldn't be able to tell right away that, unless you went to the gym with them whether they were circumcised. But um, you could tell whether they uh, they were rigorous about obeying the Sabbath. They wouldn't work. They wouldn't shop. They wouldn't cook. They wouldn't walk. They wouldn't do anything on the Sabbath. So those were the two biggest things that sort of were were symbols of being Jewish. Circumcision, absolutely, obeying the Sabbath. But the Sabbath was just the most visible evidence of obeying the Mosaic law. It was the one everybody could see if you wouldn't, you know, if you wouldn't walk more than a quarter of a mile or whatever it was on, uh, I don't remember right now, three-eighths of a mile, I think, on the Sabbath, then that was something people could see. They couldn't really tell that you never ate pork um, or various other things. But the when when he says must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses, that means the whole law. Because the Jewish belief was if you violate even one part of the law, you technically are guilty of breaking the whole law. It's a package deal. Okay? And so they're coming on, and think about the consequences of this. While circumcision was the sign of the covenant, it was the mark that you are one of the chosen people of God. And so it seems a positive thing, you know, to have to be circumcised as a Jew. Um, and the law of Moses meant you were being obedient to the covenant. But think about what it means now that these Pharisaical Christians, they and Pharisaical, that's not a derogatory term, they were Christians who had been part of the sect of the Pharisees, they come along and say, you have to be circumcised, you have to obey the law of Moses. That The ramifications of that are that faith in Jesus are not enough. That in effect, if you believe in Jesus and you get baptized, that that is not sufficient. That's only starting it. Moses, the law of Moses, the covenant of Moses, the Mosaic law and circumcision, have to fulfill it. In other words, Jesus can't close the deal. Moses has to. The ramifications of that, in terms of the, of the gospel, you know, of the good news, of what faith in Jesus meant, of how salvation is received, is huge. I mean, this is enormous. That's why this is such a big deal. This 15th chapter um, of Acts is a pivot point around which the whole future of the church is being decided over this issue. Um, and so that's why this is so critical. Now, they're, they decide they need to have a council. They're all going to go to Jerusalem. What happens when they get there? Acts 15, starting with verse 6. The apostles and elders. Now, let me explain that. There were the 12 apostles. By this time, James has been beheaded, so James is no longer alive. There are 11 apostles. Ten of the original ones, plus, plus Matthias, who was chosen to replace. Now, some of them may have gone out. We don't have histories of what happened to any of them, uh, except... Peter and Paul, and the traditions of the others. But for, there were still apostles who were part of the Central Council in Jerusalem, and there also were elders, people who were not originally apostles, but were selected for positions of leadership. For instance, James the Just, whom we're going to hear from in just a moment, who was a half-brother of Jesus, became the head of the Jerusalem Council over all the other apostles and everything else. He was elected. In that, he was called James the Just for a reason, because he was known to be a godly, and righteous, you know, uh, wise man. And so he was made the head of the Jerusalem Council. Later on, he's referred to as an apostle, but he was not one of the original 12. Okay? So that's who apostles and elders are. They are the ones that headed the church in Jerusalem. They met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Now again, Peter had gone off, off the rails on this matter in uh, Antioch, and Paul had straightened him out. So now that he's straightened out, this is what Peter says. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. He's talking about Cornelius and his household there. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, 
just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? The burden of trying to fulfill the law was more than the Jews could. You couldn't really do it. And this is a message, a big part of Jesus' message, is that you've been, in Paul, you've been in bondage to the law. The law will not save you. And so Peter's saying, why are we trying to put something on the Gentiles that we Jews have never been able to live up to? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as we are. In other they words, just as. just as they are, sorry. Um, that's it, nothing more. It's the grace of Jesus applied to us without having to change ourselves in some way, be circumcised, etc. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul, now Barnabas and Paul step up, telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. I think they're talking about the events of the church in Antioch, but more, more than that, they're talking about the events of the first missionary journey. When, um, when they were traveling into Asia Minor, there would have been Jewish communities in some of those places, uh, Jewish synagogues, but those would have been predominantly Gentile churches. And so they're preaching to, ministering to Gentiles, people are believing in Jesus, and they're not being circumcised. And so Paul and Barnabas come back, and they're talking about signs and wonders that God was doing to demonstrate that his presence with these Gentile churches was real. So now you've got Peter, you've got Paul, and you've got Barnabas all testifying that God has demonstrated to them through their actual interactions with Gentiles who came to believe in Jesus that that's all they need. They don't have to be circumcised. Okay? Let's keep going. When they finished, James spoke up. Now again, this is not James the Apostle. James the Apostle has already been killed. He was beheaded by uh, Herod Agrippa. This is James the Just, who is James the brother of Jesus. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. Let's well, stop there. Because in the Greek, the words that, that James are, is using here are very powerful to a Jewish person. When he talks about the God first intervening to choose a people, he's using the same expression there that is used, uh, the Greek word, for the same term that's used in Hebrew throughout the whole Old Testament, that the Jews are the people of God. And the word is very distinctive. And a Jew hearing that would have known He's saying a people means like we Jews are a people. And then for his name, the Jews were called the people of God. They were, they were called forth for his name. Both of the words that, that uh, and it's two words that James is using here in Greek would have been very much understood because they had the Septuagint for almost 300 years by now. Okay? that they would have very much understood. Jews often would read the, the Hebrew Bible in the Greek Septuagint. They would have understood that the words Paul is uh, James is using are clearly saying they are as much a part of God's people as we are. These Gentiles are, are part of the people of God. They are called for his name in the same way we are, because he's using the same words for it. Okay? Now, he continues, after having established that, he says, the words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written. Now he calls on the Old Testament witness of the prophets. And he quotes here from Amos chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. Those of you who are in our, our prophets class, we've been studying Amos. Okay? Um, <clears throat> After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. That means rebuild the people of Israel, the people who are David's descendants. In ruins, uh, its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. So he's going to restore the Jewish people. That the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name. Says the Lord who does these things, things known from long ago. Again, a consistent message through the Old Testament, which the Jews tended to just sort of look over. They just pass it, you know, they just wouldn't, wouldn't you know, well that's not the part I want to read. Um, is that God not only elected the Jewish people to be his people, his covenant people, but through the Jews it was his intention that all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And here he quotes the prophet Amos. 
He could have quoted the, the covenant with Abraham, which says, and through you all nations will be blessed, or the, the restating of that covenant with Isaac, or with Jacob, or with, you know, it's mentioned in, in uh, Exodus. Almost anywhere in the Old Testament you want to pick, almost most of the prophets refer to the fact that all the nations will be blessed. Here, James chooses to use the prophet Amos. It is my judgment, therefore. Now again, James is the head. He's the moderator of the council, sort of the senior elder. And he is, he's moderating this session. And so after listening to everybody, he gives his judgment. And I'm sure somebody, it's not, I mean, it's not law. Somebody gets to argue with him, but they don't. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times, and it is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Now, why in the world, after just saying that the Gentiles don't have to be circumcised and they don't have to obey the law of Moses, why would they add these, what's called the, the Jerusalem Quadrangle, the four restrictions that to the Gentiles? Well, I think the reason is very simple. The issue of the being circumcised and obeying the law of Moses was an issue of what does it what do you have to do to be saved? It was an issue of salvation. You know, the, the Christians who had come from the Pharisaic, Pharisaic sect said you had to be circumcised and follow the law of Moses to be saved. That is not what James was saying. He has just declared, affirmed the opinion of the, of the leaders, uh, elders and apostles, you don't have to be circumcised to be saved. But this becomes an issue of witness. Not of salvation, but of witness. Because it says, the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times as read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. There were certain things that the Gentiles did that the Jews abhorred, that they thought were offenses before God. And so anytime, if a Jew saw a Gentile doing one of these things, to them it just epitomized the fact that these people were practically animals. They were not the people of God. The reason why we have this Jerusalem quadrangle here is these are things that if a Jew saw a Gentile doing them, they would be so offended, they would completely reject them and everything they stood for. Well, if these Gentiles are Christians, then that means they would blow their witness, as a friend of mine used to say. They would not be able to give a witness to Jesus that anybody listened to if they were doing things that would have been perceived by the Jews as being completely, you know, off, off the rails. Now, that includes food polluted by idols. It was common in, in Greek areas and Gentile areas where they worshipped pagan gods. They would offer food as an idol to, or offer food to the idol, and they'd leave it there for a few hours, and amazingly enough, the, the gods of those idols never ate the food, so they would take it to the market and sell it. And everybody would know that. Well, the Jews thought that was the most horrendous thing possible. They would never eat that food, and they would never listen to somebody who did. So, James is saying, in order to keep from offending the Jews and pushing them away from Jesus instead of drawing them toward him, don't you do that. Don't eat food that's been offered to idols. Don't participate in sexual immorality, which there's the obvious part of that. You know, the, the remember, in most of the Greek cities, there were temples uh, that were... To, that had temple prostitution. So don't participate in any of that kind of stuff, even though it's socially acceptable. But also, sexual immorality probably will include things like, you know, um, marital, you know, marrying your half-sister or your first cousin. The sorts of things that were very common amongst the Greeks, the Gentiles, but that were considered sexually immoral to the Jews. So there would be things included in that that the, the Greeks would not have even, Greek being Gentile, same word, the Gentiles, would, many of them, would not even have thought of it as being sexually immoral, but the Jews would have thought of it that way. The meat strangled, um, and the meat of strangled animals and from blood. Strangled animals, they would strangle the animal, butcher it, but the blood was such an offense because in the blood is life, according to the Jews, they would only eat meat that had been prepared by bleeding it, completely getting all the blood out of the animal first, and then butchering it. And then blood, they actually, you know, have you eaten blood first? Okay. There are lots of dishes in the world that where you eat blood. Blood, blood first is blood sausage. The Germans, very popular in Germany, and you can get it in England. We just had some, someplace, Argentina, I think it was. <laughs> yeah, the grill, the, the grill, grill training thing, they had blood first there. Um, but anyway, 
th these are things that if the Jews saw the Gentiles doing that, there's no way they would listen to them if they tried to tell them about Jesus. Even though the Gentiles may not have thought some of this stuff was wrong. Okay? So it's not a matter of salvation, it's a matter of witness that they say this. Any questions about that? Okay. Now. Yes. Why would you eat blood today? Good. You eat meat? True. How do you like your meat cooked? Never mind. <laughs> yeah. it, it's really, I mean, there's a certain point in which you have to say it's not that, you know, if you like your meat rare or medium rare, or for heaven's sake, blue, as they call it, meaning barely cooked, they all think about just shear its horns off and slap its rope and drive it in here and we'll eat it, you know, kind of thing. Um, it, it's not that different. There are a lot of cultures in the world that eat, that eat blood and, and sausages and, and Etc. Uh, and you don't even think about it. It's just kind of sausage. It's just kind of whatever. Okay. There's African tribes that drink the blood right out of the cow. That's true. They will drink the blood warm. They will drink. They will mix blood and milk. Yeah. It's a very common drink in, in parts of Africa, the herding areas in Africa. So, and we think that's gross. But you know what? We eat things they think is gro are gross. It's just inconceivable to them. It's cultural differences. But in this case, the cultural difference affected their religious beliefs. And so James and the other people in the council are saying, do not do something that will be offensive to the Jews or you will not be able to tell them that Messiah Jesus has come in a way that they're going to listen to it. All right? Yes? Does this, uh, has this moved forward to today, these, what he said here? Well, um, the Jews of today, unless they're the ultra-Orthodox Jews, they don't have problems with you know, making sure the animals are... Most Jews go to Walmart and buy their steaks wrapped in plastic just like we do. They don't worry about kosher. People, the, the Orthodox Jews who maintain kosher, one of the things is they will only buy meat from a kosher butcher, which means the meat has been dealt with in such a way that all the blood's been drained out of it, etc., etc. They would never eat blood sausage, uh, you know, they, etc. Um, we don't have problems so much with meat offered to idols anymore, uh, at least not that people would recognize. And so some of this doesn't fit anymore. There's not the issue with most Jewish people, but it's true that if you're if you're ministering to a, if you're trying to evangelize or witness to a, a conservative Jew, they may throw some of this stuff back at you. Okay? In which case our response has to be an articulation of what part of the ancient Jewish law do we accept as being required now. And that's what this whole Council of Jerusalem's about, is how much of the law is still valid for us. Not valid for salvation. But the belief that God truly has ordained a descendant from David, the Messiah, that's the part of the law that the emphasis is on, and that Messiah was Jesus. Okay? So let's keep reading. Then the apostles and elders, with the whole church, decided to choose some of their own men. Now, they, they accepted this, this letter, or this uh, idea from James. Choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, men who were leaders among the believers. Now, interestingly, uh, Judas Barsabbas is a very Hebrew name. Silas is a Latin name. In fact, his last name was Silas Silvanus, which means he would have not... So they're getting somebody who would... would the Hebrew side of it is represented and the Gentile side of it is represented, both of whom are believers in Jesus. But you're getting a you know, cross-section here. There's a reason why they chose those two men. This is the same Silas who would later travel with Paul in his second missionary journey and later. Um, and that's why we know something about him. The okay, with them they sent the following letter. The apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Antioch was the capital of Syria, so it's that whole region. It's the city, the region, and Cilicia is the area up around the corner, which is where uh, Tarsus, which is where... Uh, Paul was from. And so these areas, which were the areas that they had mostly Gentile converts. This letter also gets carried on to the churches in Galatia and other places, but this is who it's addressed to. Greetings. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. In Galatians, when Paul is writing about this, he tells us that these these Judaizers who came from Jerusalem to Antioch and threw them into a tizzy by telling them they had to be circumcised, when, he challenged, when they presented themselves, they said, oh, we're coming from James at the church in Jerusalem. So they claimed they were representing the head of the Jerusalem council. 
they weren't. They were lies. And that's the reason why James here makes a clear point. They went out without our authorization. If they told you they came from me, that's not true. We've heard that some, that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all, all of us in the council here, agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends, Barnabas and Paul, our friends. Okay? We're all in agreement here. We're sending you this letter, but we're also sending along our friends, your leaders, Barnabas and Paul, and two other guys that are, are from our council. Men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. Now, several things. We just heard in the, the, a moment ago, in the last slide, uh, before this one, well, two slides back, Peter giving testimony what his experience had been with Cornelius and the Gentiles. That's the last we hear from Peter in Acts. At this point, this is, as I say, the pivot point in a lot of ways. From this point on, the focus is on Paul, not on Peter. It's also at this point that the focus moves away from the Jerusalem church, the founding church, the mother church, the church in Jerusalem, that had been the place, you know, it was at, in the temple courts that 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost became Christians. 2,000 more were added shortly after that, and on and on and on. All of that was based in Jerusalem. You get little offshoots, you know, you get church in Antioch, you get Philip, you know, evangelizing, etc. But still the center point, the anchor of the Christian faith was Jerusalem. That changes. From now on we hear very little about Jerusalem, except when Paul comes back, just long enough to cause a riot and get arrested. And then he leaves again. Okay, um, So there's a lot that changes right here. When they send these guys off with this letter, the, the people who are the main focus change, the, the, uh, the organization of the church focus changes. That doesn't mean the church in Jerusalem doesn't exist. It continued to exist for um, at least 50 or 60 years after this until Jerusalem was finally destroyed in AD 70. There were still some, some lingerers, and there were still Christians who were, from time to time, uh, going to Jewish worship services, and then there was an additional um, rebellion that happened after the Roman destruction in which the, the Romans just completely shut everything down, and the Jews and Christians stopped having anything to do with each other, and the church in Jerusalem died at that point. Uh, okay, so the letter goes out. Let's keep going. Acts 15.30. So the men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. Prophet means they spoke the word of God to them. It doesn't mean they told the future. After spending some time there, they were sent off by the believers with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached the word of God. Silas, there are some ancient texts that said Silas stayed there, um, and Judas Barsabbas went back. But the best, the best texts say they both went back. The reason they have added that in is that then we don't have an explanation for how Silas got back up to Antioch so that he could leave with, with Paul very shortly here. But at some point, he did come back up. All right. We now, this is the end of uh, chapter 15, let me finish this up, and, and it sets the stage for what's coming up in chapter 16. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of God, the word of the Lord, and see how they are doing. And part of it, I'm sure, is they wanted to take this news to them. You know, the, the letter and the, the indication that the council in Jerusalem has decided all this. For, and it affects them because they're predominantly Gentile churches. Barnabas wanted to take John also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now, Paul and Barnabas have a falling out because Barnabas... Uh, 
um, wanted to take his, his young cousin, John Mark, with them a second time. Well, last time, after Cyprus, they get to the mainland of Turkey, and John Mark leaves and goes back to Jerusalem. He goes home. And Paul, and, Mark, and Paul was upset about this. It may have been that John Mark just didn't like having to carry the luggage anymore because he was along as an assistant. It may have been that he was upset that that's the point at which, when they leave Cyprus after uh, the, the issue with the, uh, Elimus the sorcerer, that Paul establishes his authority there. Paul becomes the leader and Barnabas is the second. It may have been that offended John Mark because Barnabas was his cousin and he thought he should be in charge. We don't know exactly why. But John Mark had left them before they actually really got into anything and now wants to go with them again and Barnabas wants to take him. Paul doesn't want to take him. He, he ran off last time. I don't want to take him this time. Now, later on, and we know this from things that Paul says in his letters, Later on, Barnabas and Paul are completely reconciled. This is, they didn't break faith with each other. They just had an argument over how we're going to do this mission trip. And then also, John Mark is spoken very possibly of by Paul later. John Mark later on becomes the assistant to Peter and writes the Gospel of Mark. This is the same Mark that wrote the Gospel of Mark, and that's why we believe the Gospel of Mark is predominantly the Gospel according to Peter, because John Mark spent many years as secretary and assistant to Peter. Okay? Question? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, so they go through Syria and Cilicia. Um, and by the way, hang in there because I have a bunch of pictures to show you. So I'm going to impose my slideshows on you. No. So Paul's second missionary journey. They start out, um, and, and I'm wondering where do I have a map here? Um, I'll, I'll give you a map in just a second. Paul came to Derby and then to, to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish, her name was Eunice, by the way, and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Peter wanted to take him, or sorry, Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. I'll explain that in a second. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. So why, after what they just went through, does Paul circumcise Timothy? Very simple reason. The same reason that they gave the, the Jewish uh, quadrangle, the four rules, uh, is it was an issue of witness. In the Jewish faith... A person's Jewishness comes not from your father, but from your mother. Okay? Which meant Timothy was Jewish, but he'd never been circumcised because his father was Greek and his father probably didn't want him to be circumcised. That meant, technically, even though he was from his Jewish, genetically Jewish from his mother, if he was not circumcised, he would not have been allowed to go into any of the synagogues. He would not have been listened to, if, 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 and they knew about him. You notice it says here, the Jews who lived in the area all knew that his father was a Greek. They knew that he wasn't fully Jewish. They knew he wasn't circumcised. I mean, he, was, he had a Jewish mother, but they would have known he wasn't circumcised. He had not been participating in synagogue, which he wouldn't have been able to if he wasn't circumcised. And so the reason Paul circumcises Timothy is so that will, will increase the opportunities for him to be involved in ministry to Jewish people, as well as to Gentiles. Not because it's a matter of salvation. Again, the opposition to circumcision was that the, the, the Judaizers were saying you have to be circumcised to be saved. Paul did not circumcise Timothy in order for him to be saved. He's already saved. He did it so that he could be effective in witnessing the Jewish people. On the other hand, if you read in Galatians, again, back to Galatians, this whole description of this problem, some of the Judaizers insisted that Titus, one of the other pastors that Paul mentors, that Titus be circumcised in order to make sure he's saved, and Paul refuses, absolutely. So Paul would not circumcise if it was because they thought it was necessary for salvation, but he would circumcise Timothy because that allowed him to minister in a way he wouldn't have been able to otherwise. Okay? First John and then Florida. Uh, you, you mentioned that they all knew about Timothy. You know, I knew his background, so I'm assuming they didn't know him. I mean, well, you know, what, what, I mean, the guy goes to the temple, what does he, does he, I mean, how does he prove he's been circumcised? <laughs> does he pull out a certificate, or does he just, you know, just show the evidence? I mean, 
I mean, these, they, this, this was a very serious right. This was a very serious exactly. right. Exactly. Did they carry documentation? Well, um, again, he had lived and grown up in one place. People didn't travel like they did then. Um, the well, I knew he had a reputation. But I mean, you had these people coming uh, on the day of Pentecost from all over the region, right. and they're coming, and they're coming to the temple. So, you know, my question is... There's a certain point at which you, they take your word for it. I'm sure that if anybody <laughs> had a serious question in the, in the temple, for instance, the guards of the temple might drag you out back and check it out. Yeah. But for the most part, they probably would have accepted it. But in a situation like this, where they knew right. Timothy, they'd known him since he was born, you know, it's... it's the, whole, the Jewish community would have been very aware because his mother was Jewish, but he would not have been able to participate in any Jewish ceremony without being circumcised. And they would have known from when he was an infant that his father had said, no, I don't want him circumcised. So he was not, and, and he was well known, not only in his own town of Lystra, but in Iconium, which is the next town over. Um, and so, yeah, the fact that everybody knew him, they knew he wasn't circumcised when he was a child because they would have been to the ceremony if he had been. Um, but, yeah, other than that, I mean, this, if somebody walked into the temple, th this is the reason why they had a sign in the, the, they had a courtyard of the Gentiles. But when you left the courtyard of the Gentiles and started moving in toward the actual temple in Jerusalem, there was a sign there that said, no Gentiles. And any Gentile who enters beyond this point uh, is, is under the death penalty. In fact, the reason that they arrested Paul eventually is they claimed that he brought a Gentile into the inner courts. You know, they didn't know that for a fact because, you know, they were clothed. But, um, in fact, Paul had. What had happened is they had seen him with a Gentile Christian believer in Jerusalem, not in the temple. But they extrapolated from that that he probably brought him in here too. So, but the reason they had a sign up like that is because it wasn't obvious. And they were warning people off because if somebody, if somebody knew someone and said, he's not a Jew, he's a Gentile, then they would have dragged him off and checked him out. And if he had not been Jewish, he would have been executed. And they were warm. So this was a big deal to them. Okay, floor at first. Okay. Um, these four requirements, or their suggestions, were they part of the law of Moses and were they considered a sin if you you participated in those things? Yes. Okay, so now what happens is the Gentiles come in, but they're not under the law of Moses. Correct. So this is just a suggestion, but if the person followed these things as a Gentile, it would not be a sin, because it wasn't stated in the... Yeah, it's not an issue of sin, it's sin or salvation. It's an issue, again, of witness. Okay. He's saying, this is not a, this is not addressed to Jews, because they wouldn't have done this anyway. It's addressed to Gentiles and saying, here are four things that really, when Gentiles do them, Jews get really ticked off. Mm -hmm. You don't want to, and they're visible, and you can see it. Okay, and these are things that generally you people will know if you do this. You know, if you hang around with temple prostitutes or marry your, you know, your your half sister or whatever, um, and so don't do them. <coughs> you can put your hand down too. I'll get to you in a minute. I, you guys are going to wear yourselves out holding your hands up all the time. I need the uh, uh, Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the um, and so it's for Gentiles, and it's to say don't do these things because this will ruin any chance you have of telling Jewish people about Jesus. It has nothing to do with their salvation. It has nothing to do with, is this a sin for you or not? Because we're not under the law anymore. I can eat blood sausage and not sin. That's not an issue now. But it was for them if a Jew saw them doing it. Okay, that was the whole point. So it's a witnessing. It, it's a, a counseling piece about how to witness effectively to Jewish people or how not to blow your witness to Jewish people. Okay, Mike. I was going to say that the local rabbi would have known absolutely whether they were oh, yeah. circumcised as well. So yeah, and well, and, and again, in the Jewish community, in a place like one of the cities in, in uh, Asia Minor, they all would have known. I mean, they, they, if they were, unless they just weren't old enough, they would have been there when he got circumcised because this was a community thing, and etc. Okay, okay. Well, and the other thing about that, Jews traveled from one place to another, and when they were in those cities, they were going to be in those synagogues. Mm -hmm. So if they were traveling in another city and, and teaching and preaching, it was very likely there could have been a, there right. were going to be Jews there that would be familiar with them. Yeah. But so, yeah. Either way, it's just so there could not be any question that he was acceptable to Jews in a way, and, and it's very similar. I mean, the, the the Jerusalem quadrangle, as they called it, it was so you will be acceptable and be able to speak to Jews as a Gentile. Here, he's going the next step and saying so that Timothy would be completely acceptable as a Jewish man 
who can then say, I'm a Jew, and I believe that Jesus is the Messiah we've been waiting for. That's the witness of Jewish Christians even today. Timothy couldn't have a powerful witness of that way if he wasn't fully a Jew. Lynn? So do we presume then that uh, he grew up in a Jewish household, although his father was Greek, so that people knew him to be a, a Jew by his practices at home, but not through his circumcision? Well, he would not have, he may have, his mother may have done Seder meals at home and that sort of thing. We don't know. We have no way of knowing about that. But he could not have participated in any of the Jewish events of the community that would have required that he be circumcised. He couldn't be one of the ten who gathered for prayer or anything like that. Okay. Um, what they did at home, we don't know. I mean, he, his mother was Jewish. So she may have done some. Jew we, was minimal. Yeah. Well, we don't know. I mean, we simply don't know. But what, wasn't his mother and grandmother, um, weren't they Christians? Yes. Well, they were they Jewish were Christians. Christians. Yeah. So, His mother that, was a Jew, was Jewish and a believer. Yeah, so it might not have been, been a big Jewish thing. Yeah, in, in that time, a lot of the Jews were still practicing, yeah. you know, the, 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 the Jewish Christians were still practicing the Jewish services. I mean, that's why we have Peter and John going up to the temple at, the, you know, the third hour in the afternoon, um, the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon, to pray. That was the time Jews went to pray. John? It's interesting that it, despite his attempt, to try to protect his witness, that's the very thing that he was arrested for. Yeah, exactly. Even though he was very conscientious about that. Right. So, and for all of this, they traveled from town to town, delivered the decision reached by the apostles, so they're sharing it with all of these people. Here's what the decision has been about, you know, what, what's required for salvation. And the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. There is continuing church growth. The persecution out of Jerusalem is no longer apparently a problem. That's not happening. Now, this is the same map, but whereas I told you this blue line was the first missionary journey, the second missionary journey is overland from Antioch through Isis to Tarsus, which is in Cilicia. You remember they said, you know, in Antioch, Syria, Cilicia, that that's where, you know, they were sending them the letter out to. And then from Tarsus, Paul's hometown, they went across the mountains, the, the pass in the mountains is called, it's called the Silesian Gates, because you're walking across snow-covered mountains, okay? These are high mountains. To the cities that they visited earlier in the first missionary journey, Derby, Lystra, which is where they pick up Timothy, and Iconium, and then they cross over to Antioch of Pisidia, and then head north, and we're going to read about that in just a minute. That's this route. So this red line here is the second missionary journey, okay? Is that clear? That's where we're talking about now. They've just picked up Timothy here in uh, Lystra, and they've gone over to Iconium. Now, um, let's take a break. I want to start back now, and I want to start with the map, and because I want to point to a couple of things that we're about to read about. <clears throat> excuse, me, excuse me. You'll notice from Antioch and Pisidia, after being in Lystra and Iconia, from here, Paul is about to tell us that he was planning to come this way, which was generally this, this kind of section here. The whole, the whole land mass was called Asia Minor, but this was often referred to as Asia. Because Ephesus, right there, I have a tic tac. Ephesus is the capital of Asia. Okay? Um, in fact, you might notice the letters that Paul writes. Uh, Thessalonica was the capital of, um, of Thrace. <laughs> Or Philippi was the capital of Thrace, Thessalonica was the capital of Macedonia. <clears throat> a number of the letters he wrote were the capital cities. Well, Ephesus was the capital of Asia. Well, the indication, which Paul will tell us, is he was planning to come this way. And he was prevented from doing so. We don't know why. He says, I was prevented by the Spirit of the Lord. So he heads north, and he's thinking he'll go up here to Bithynia, which is, you know, the very important city of Byzantium and on the Black Sea. He gets up so far and he says, but the Lord prevented us from doing that. So he turns west again, and follows along the north side of the province of Mycia, and comes down to Troas. Now I want to just give you a picture of that. Paul was trying to go that way, couldn't, so he headed north, got stopped from that, headed back west, ends up here, and then he finds out why. And people said, well, why, you know, why does God not, did not have him go there? Later on, in, in Peter's writings, Peter wrote letters to Christians and to, you know, others, <laughs> 
people who were considering the faith here and up here, and it may be that God was sort of planning that Peter would be the one who would have influence there, and he had other thoughts for, for Paul. But wanted to give you that sense of it. Also, from Troas, when they sail across, they stop at Samothrace, which is an island, and then they land at the city of Neapolis. Neapolis is the, mod the modern Neapolis is called Kavala. There is a city there, a port city, Kavala, which used to be Neapolis. And I mention that because I'm going to show you some pictures from there. Okay? Acts 16. Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. Remember the Galatian, uh, the towns, uh, churches. Having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia, which has been, if you'd gone directly west toward Ephesus. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, which is on the north. But the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. And again, we don't know exactly in what way that, that preventing happened. but So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had, the vision, had a, a vision of a man of Macedonia. This is the northern area of Greece, what we know as Greece. Standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, he got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, one thing that's very important here, this is where Paul links up with Luke, or rather Luke links up with Paul. He met Luke, Paul met Luke, Paul and Silas met Luke in Troas. How do we know that? Because mm. he begins to say we and us. Yeah, he starts using a, you know the personal pronoun plural us. Um, so this is, and there's a couple of places where we can tell where Luke is with Paul, or where for, for various times he gets separated from him because he says he and they or we and us. Okay, this is where Luke meets up with Paul. Now, this thing about a uh, vision of a man of Macedonia, I mentioned Kabbalah. The modern city that was the port city of Neapolis, right in Kabbalah, and we just stumbled across this, we were walking around in Kabbalah, there is a mosaic, and this thing is, is in like a little corner of a street. Um, it's probably 15 or 20 feet tall. I mean, it's big. It's a big mosaic. This is one section of it, and it is uh, Paul, mosaic of Paul, having a vision of a Macedonian man. If you know anything about Alexander the Great or whatever, you can tell this guy wearing a sword, with a, you know, a, a, wearing armor, he looks like a Macedonian. Some people even said maybe it was Alexander the Great who, you know, who was speaking to to uh, Paul. Because not likely. I mean, you know, unless his spirit came back for some reason. But um, and so he had a vision of a Macedonian man saying, "Come across and help us." And this is the, you know, the Aegean Sea. The other half of this is this. On this one mosaic, you then have Paul stepping out of a boat onto. Um, the, the, the land in Greece. Now, today, we would say he left Asia and went to Europe. This is the first missionary effort by Paul to Europe. They didn't think of them as Asia and Europe back then. They were all provinces in Rome. He was still in, you know, in uh, the Roman Empire. He was still in the same country, in effect, but they just had different provinces, like going from one state to another within the same country. But today, that would be leaving Asia, the continent of Asia, and going to the continent of Europe. Okay, so this mosaic, if you ever go to Kabbalah, uh, I can tell you how to find it. So, um, a couple of other things. Uh, Ross, um, there was a, I read in a commentary, uh, doing some study on 1 Thessalonians, and it takes, goes back to Acts there. Mm -hmm. And this commentator said that the people of that area of Macedonia had a peculiar dress. It'd be like the Kichwa. If you see a Kichwa, you know he's a Kichwa yeah. because of the way he's dressed. And so there was this peculiar dress that included this headdress that really um, localized uh, this this man in the vision from yeah. where he was from. And from that, this commentator was speculating that Paul understood. Right. Uh, and, and even even this, I mean, look at how Paul's dress, you know, floor length, wrap around clothing, tunic kind of stuff. Look at how this guy's dressed. You know, he's above the knees, leggings, very different. So whatever the difference in dress would be, um, or whether it was actually the, vi the vision or simply the knowledge. I mean, you know, sometimes you dream things, um, and 
you have awarenesses of things even though nobody sure. said it or whatever. And it could have been that God made him aware of it as part of the vision without it being a visual clue. But, you know, the indication is that this, this sort of does the same thing. You know, it's a very distinctive kind of dress compared to what Paul was used to. Okay? Okay. Now, this is a uh, blow-up, an enlargement of that map uh, that we were looking at. So you can see from Troas, they stopped the night in Samothrace, and Luke apparently must have been at least a hobby sailor because he gives us a lot of details about the wind and the storm and where they stopped, and you know, uh, and, and they must have had very good winds because they, this is about 150 miles from Troas. Stop overnight in Samoth Race and get to Neapolis, and they covered it in only two days. It took them almost five days to come the other direction later, okay? Um, so they had good winds, and they land in Neapolis. From Neapolis, they then go over to Philippi, and that's actually, you know, the, he mentions how far they had to walk to get from, from Neapolis to Philippi. Then um, he goes past Amphipolis to Thessalonica, from Thessalonica to Berea, then leaves Berea and goes by sea down to Athens, then over to Corinth, and then back. I mention that because we're going to get into the first part of this, Thessalonica and Berea, probably today. Um, I wanted to point out, too, this line right here, this black line, you'll notice it says Ignatian Way. The Ignatian Way was a Roman road, a major Roman road that went from Rome, over here, <laughs> to Byzantium. It's still there, parts of it, okay? And I'll show you a marker that's been there for a couple thousand years. Um, and that meant, because that was the major Roman road, that meant, and you'll notice these cities are all right on it. That meant these were very, uh, they had a lot of traffic. They were major cities, they would have been, they're right on a major trade route, they would have been major merchandising going on there, etc. So you get the idea, these are significant population centers that Paul is talking about here, and again, Thessalonica was the capital of Macedonia. Philippi was the capital of Thrace. These were provinces of what we know as Greece, and then Achaia down here. Okay. Um, all right. This is a stone in Philippi that marks the Via Ignatia um, or the Ignatian Way. Via Ignatia. This is Latin. This is Greek. This is a stone marker that's a, you know a couple thousand years old that's been there the whole time, and there are still large paving stones there that are part of the Ignatian Way. And I say that because you need to know, this is real! <laughs> this stuff really happened. How Sometimes big is, we, how big is that? It's like this. Yeah, it's, it's sitting on the ground. I mean, I, I, or, or, there's a little stone wall there, actually, you know, sitting on that, but it's not very tall, not very large. It's like a, like a road sign, you know, uh, which is literally what it was. Um, all right, let's keep going. You've got, you've got the perspective now. I do have more pictures in a minute. So Paul enters Europe, and he walks, they walk from Neapolis to Philippi, as you're about to hear. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, which is an island, and the next day we went on to Neapolis. So they sailed 150 miles in two days. From there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. Now Philippi was named for Philip of Macedonia, Anybody know who he was? Father, Father of Alexander the Great. And one of the most underrated um, historical figures ever. Because his son was Alexander the Great, nobody talks about Philip anymore. And the only reason Alexander the Great was so great is because Philip was great. And he prepared him for it, and he prepared the army for it. They think one of the reasons Philip, Philip created the army that Alexander used, one of the reasons they think it may have been so powerful and so great is they think that they, Philip may have invented the stirrup. That they may have been, may have been, you don't know for a fact, it may have been the first army in history that had horses with stirrups. Can you imagine trying to fight a battle on a horse with no stirrups? It made a huge difference. Okay, sometimes it's the little things. Okay, so Philippi was named for Philip. Roman colony, leading city of that district of Macedonia, actually it's the capital. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. It was not, they did not have enough Jews for there to be a synagogue in so they're looking for a place of prayer. To have a, even to have a formal prayer meeting in, in the Jewish faith, you had to have ten men. I don't know if I've told you all the story. First, I went to Israel uh, after college, and I flew over on El Al. And a long flight to El Al. The planes weren't as fast back then as they are now. And like three times during the flight, somebody pecked me on the shoulder and said, would you join us for prayer? And I go, 
goy, you know, I'm a Gentile. They go, oh. they have to have ten men. And so like three times during this flight, ten Jewish men would gather at the back of the airplane and wrap the phylacteries and the whole thing, and you know, they would be doing the prayers. Um, and then when the plane landed in Israel, they were playing the theme song from um, Exodus. Exodus. And the plane's landing, right? And the people are in the aisles <laughs> doing this because they're headed back to Israel. Oh, that hurt. I hurt my shoulder. <laughs> I have a bad shoulder. Okay. Um, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the woman who had get, women who had gathered there. Notice it's women. There weren't ten men to make it an official place for prayer. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira, a city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The, the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. Now, Thyatira was in Asia Minor. She is from where Paul just came from, okay, in, further south, near Ephesus. And it was a city that was known for dyes. They created dyes for cloth. And so this is a businesswoman who lives and has business in Philippi. She's actually from across the Aegean Sea. Okay. Um, the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. <laughs> the Greek word here for persuaded probably would be more accurately translated forced us. <laughs> this was a, a pushy broad, <laughs> a businesswoman who would not take no for an answer. You know, if you think I'm a believer, I mean, if you are serious about the fact you think I'm a follower of Jesus, then come and stay at my house. No, no, I won't take no for an answer. And she forced them to come and stay with her. Okay. Now, in outside Philippi, there is a stream. The stream where they gathered, a small river, a stream is a better word for it, was originally called the Gigantus River. They now generally refer to it as Lydia's Stream. And there is a place there that is very, very popular for people to be baptized. Now, we didn't have anybody baptized, but when we were there, we had a communion service. It's very hard to see this. <laughs> this is the stream. It flows this way. And this is a little uh, sort of football-shaped island in the middle. And there are a couple of kind of pathways over. So the water flows here, and it flows around that way. And they have a little sort of shrine there with, a, with an image in it of Lydia. And this is very popular for people to come and be baptized. We had a communion service. This, this is um, John Yates, Yates from uh, Church in Virginia. So um, we had a baptism service there. This is the chapel of Lydia, which is about 50 yards or so from, from where we, what you just saw. Uh, it is a chapel that has been put there to celebrate the, you know, the coming of the faith to that area through Paul. And uh, pretty little chapel. This stained glass windows, this is Paul, this is Lydia. You can always tell Paul because he's one of these men that has a large forehead. <laughs> In other words, he's bald. Uh, Paul always is bald. Peter always is carrying keys. There, there were clear symbols to understand who, who's represented in religious art and Christian art that you need to understand. So uh, Paul and Lydia, this is Paul, Timothy, who was with them again? They picked him up in, in Lystra, and Luke. And if you you know if you read Greek, you can read Paul, Timothy, and Luke. Um, Luke is the one writing. <laughs> okay. Um, this is there are several mosaics. This is kind of at a weird angle because there was a light hanging right in front of it, and I had to get at a weird angle in order to try to get it. Uh, but this is all part of the chapel in Lydia. They have all kinds of mosaics and stained glass and paintings. It's quite extraordinary for such a small chapel. Okay. Uh, any questions about that? Are those contemporary? That's a contemporary chapel, isn't it? Um, it's it's contemporary meaning modern times, modern uh, times. but not uh, sixty years ago, I think, or it's something. Like, it's like, yeah. So, so no, these, not, are, these are these are not ancient. No, it's not an ancient thing. No, but there's been I mean there's been a chapel there, but they built this one as a you know more recent, and it's a very nice chapel. Uh, Paul and Silas are in Philippi now with Luke. Once when we were going to the place of prayer. We were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. Now, when it says she had a spirit, the word there literally is um, a spirit of Pythias. Has anybody been to Delphi? Mm -hmm. 
know, the Oracle of Delphi, in, uh, which is up in the mountains of Greece, same country, but up in the mountains, that was the most famous place where they had oracles. They believed that there were gases that came up that were intoxicating <coughs> gases, and there were women there who were the oracles who would get high on these gases, and they would give uh, prophecies. And people would come from all over the world for a prophecy there. Alexander the Great went there for a prophecy, and others. Um, and it was believed that there's this one pit where the gases would come up and stuff, that down in there, there was a giant python, a giant snake. And it was the spirit of the python that gave them the ability to give these oracles. This is the mythology. That spirit was, was the spirit of Apollo. The followers of Apollo in this whole oracle kind of thing were called Pythians. And so literally that's where we get Python, the snake, and this is the spirit of Pythias. If you ever read about Pythias, that is, the, is, is a Greek idea of being able to tell the future of oracles. Okay, And that's all the basis of the oracle of Delphi. So, this woman had the spirit of Pythias, which means she prophesied or, or gave oracles of the future. Um, she followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Yes. You can imagine being followed around by somebody yelling, These men, oh, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, all comes back to money, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authority. If you go to Philippi today, you, you can walk around in the huge marketplace area they have. It's, it's just ruins now, you know, uh, but it's there. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. They had done no such thing. They had just messed up with these, messed these guys' money-making uh, ideas up. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now, what these guys did when they, when they dragged Paul and Silas in and accused them, they used racial prejudice to get everybody against them. These men are Jews, throwing our city into an uproar, advocating customs unlawful for us Romans. Okay, There's a, there's a racial prejudice being, card being played here that we don't even see because we don't think that way so much anymore. So they throw Paul and Silas in jail. Now, this is the prison of St. Paul, and we know that because it says right there, the prison of St. Paul. <laughs> this is in Philippi. Uh, it has it in Greek as well as in English, of course, although they don't know how to use a period or apostrophe in St. Paul. Um, this is one of those things, Earl Pastor, Earl Palmer, who was on the trip where we did this, and Earl does a lot of speaking on trips and things like that, and he said every once in a while you run into something like this where they claim, you know, that this was where Paul was in prison, or, you know, that this was where, the exact spot where the upper room event was held, and Earl said, we can't discount that because there may be some truth to it. So he said, so I always just look at that and go, well, one wonders. <laughs> One wonders, was this really the prison of Paul? We don't know. But down inside this, you can see that there's something back behind it. It looks like this. And the tradition is that this actually was the inner cell where Paul and Silas were put in stocks or chained um, and held in prison after being severely beaten in Philippi. Okay? One wonders. No, we don't know. But that's the traditional location of it. Okay? Probably, yeah, yeah. I doubt those wooden beams have been there that long ago. Okay. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. They had just been beaten severely. And they spend the night praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken, which is probably why it looks like that other picture right now. <laughs> At once, all the prison doors flew apart, and everyone's chains came loose. 
The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. Remember, we talked before about the fact that if prisoners escaped from a Roman guard or jailer, that guard or jailer would suffer the same penalty that the prisoner would have gotten if they were found guilty. And in a case like this, it may be the jailer wants to kill himself because it was not uncommon in this kind of situation. They would have killed not only him, but his family. Whereas if he takes his own life, they probably would leave his family alone. That's why he's getting ready to kill himself. Um, but Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. So Gentile converts in Philippi, in addition to Lydia, who would have been Gentile, we have others who um, become Christians. Now... This is one of those places, by the way, even though the jailer and his family, his household, got baptized, when they're asked by the jailer, what must I do to be saved? What are the requirements? What is necessary for my salvation? They reply, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved in your household. They don't say you have to be baptized. They don't say you have to be fully immersed. They don't say you have to speak in tongues. None of that. Just like Paul in Romans 10. None of that is there. If you believe in your heart, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We add all these other accretions. And yet if all those things were really necessary for salvation, then I believe the word of God would include all of the things that are required every time. There are places it says, you know, believe and be baptized, which is a good idea, a strong recommendation, but not necessary for salvation. Or it would be there every time. Just a little theology for you. Yes? Clarification too, because there's such strong feeling about taking the baptism of children because of this incident. Mm -hmm. And also, what's what's really nice too is that uh, uh, maybe, maybe you don't have to be baptized. Maybe you could just believe under certain circumstances where right. you couldn't be baptized. Yeah, baptism is not necessary for salvation. It's a good idea. We're instructed to do it, yeah. but we're. We're not told in every instance where it talks about what's necessary for salvation. We're not told. It's not included every time. All right. If you go to Philippi today, you will find lots of pieces of rock with crosses on them. This is a pillar that was just outside the arena, uh, the theater there in Philippi. I could have given you a dozen more where there are rocks just strewn about, but they have carved crosses on them. The Christian faith came to this part of Greece, to Philippi, right here in the 16th chapter of, um, of Acts. And so all of the Christian symbolism, you could tie it directly back to this, all right? Now we have a very cool story about Paul. Yes? We never hear what happened to the jailer. Um, <coughs> actually? I haven't read it carefully. Either. Yeah, we, we get another reference to him. We don't know exactly. He's not punished, as far as we can tell. In fact, quite the contrary. Um, a parade from prison, I call this, all right? When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. <laughs> I love Paul. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens, and they threw us into prison. Now they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come themselves and escort us out. Guy had hood spot. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, uh, requesting him, not ordering him, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters, encouraged them, then they left. In the Roman Empire, a Roman citizen could not be um, arrested and punished without trial. In fact, they couldn't be punished by anyone who wasn't a Roman authority. 
Um, if somebody committed a crime, if they were a Roman citizen, they had to be turned over to the Roman authorities. Here, local authorities, not officially part of the Roman, they were magistrates, they were not part of the Roman court system. They grabbed Paul and Silas, and without asking them anything or finding out anything, they gave him a, ro a royal beating and threw him in prison. When they found out they'd done that to Roman citizens, they knew if Paul went to the Roman military and said, I am a Roman citizen and these guys did this to me, these guys would pay for it. You, know, you didn't do that. You didn't get away with that against Roman citizens. If you weren't a Roman citizen, all bets were off. But if you were a Roman citizen, you had privileges. And one of them was you didn't get arrested and beaten and thrown in jail without going through the formalities. And so Paul makes a point. And in doing so, he establishes, in, in some ways, the respectability of what he'd been talking about. You know, he, he established a respectability to the faith he'd been advocating uh, by, by demanding, you know, by saying, I'm not some lowlife that just wandered into town and started doing bad stuff. I'm a Roman citizen, and you need to treat me with respect. And they knew they needed to, and so they did. <coughs> yes? What made Paul a Roman citizen? Well, he either, there were uh, three ways you could become a Roman citizen. You would inherit it, which is probably what Paul did. You could purchase it, which is very expensive. In fact, when Paul gets arrested, and we'll see this later, when Paul gets arrested in Jerusalem, the, um, the head of the guard that arrests him, um, when Paul says he's a Roman citizen, and the guy says, I'm a Roman citizen, it cost me a fortune. How did you, you know, what, what's up with you? Or you could perform some significant service to the emperor or the empire and be awarded citizenship. Okay. Um, that's, those were the only ways you did it. Now, um, most of the people who were citizens inherited it. Some people, particularly army officers, if they wanted to move up in the ranks, they would purchase it. But that's very expensive. Or, you know, you, you would have Roman citizens who joined the military and did great service or saved the emperor's life or something of that sort. Okay. And they would be awarded citizenship. The indication is that Paul's father and maybe his predecessors before that even had been Roman citizens somehow. So a Jew could be a Roman citizen. There's no, that was not uh, possible. All right. So again, this is this is the map, and from Philippi, Paul and his friends who have just left from Philippi, they travel through Amphipolis and they end up in Thessalonica, which is the capital of Macedonia. Okay. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas. Oh, oh did I? I think I skipped something. I did skip something. Just a second. I keep my Bible up here. Yes, I did. The first two verses. Let me just read them to you and then we'll go on with this. I don't know why I missed that as a slide. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. That's three weeks. Explaining and proving that the Messiah, or it could be two weeks with three Sabbaths in there. Explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks. There's that God-fearing Greek again. Gentiles who wanted to believe in one God and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They went and hired thugs. They rushed to Jason's house in order to search for, uh, in, in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them there, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. And Jason, was wel uh, Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees. This is the thing that the, the, the Christians got accused of more than anything else, is they're violating the law of Caesar. Because that's the number one way you get the Roman authorities to come down on somebody, is that they were, if they look like they were being seditious, going against the Roman law. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there's another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. 
Then they made Jesus, uh, Jason and the others post bond and let them go. So there's a riot in the city, and these people are making all these wild accusations against, particularly the Jews started it, because they were jealous about the fact that some of these Jews were beginning to believe what Paul and Silas had to say about Jesus as the Messiah. So, that's the setting. Now we pick up here in verse 10. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those of Thessalonica. I went to Berea College, which is named after this. On arriving, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. But when the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, some of them went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up, chasing him down. And it's, it's a pretty good distance from Thessalonica to Berea. The believers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed in Berea. Those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left, for, left instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him there as soon as possible. Let me go back to the map. So, Thessalonica, Berea, I'm guessing that's probably 30 miles. They, they went, went there on foot, so they were determined. They created problems in Berea, and then you'll notice that they sent Paul away. They left Silas and Timothy there. They sent Paul away, and they, they went by sea inside the island of Ebola, down around to Athens, and then sent word back that they should join uh, to Paul to Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. Okay, so they got Paul out of town because he was the focal point of so much of the trouble that Thessalonican Jews had caused. First in Thessalonica and then Berea. All right. So Paul um, was escorted by some Bereans. Is that what I? Yes. Heard? Some of some of the some of the people that were that believed him. Some of his supporters yeah. took him. Because, well, you'll notice that it's it's um, it's a little distance from Berea. Is not right on the coast. Mm -hmm. you know, so they they escorted him to the coast and put him on the ship. Make sure he was oh, okay. safe. So he he went to Athens on his own. Probably so. Oh, yeah. Okay. When they said escorted him, I think from Berea just, to the coast to, to put him on a boat. Okay. Is the way I read that. Um, because it'd be kind of cool to have him have that opportunity to teach them for. It does say those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens, so maybe they did travel with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because huh. I would think that they would want to get some instruction from him when they just right. started believing. I just realized I had these out of order. This was the one I was looking for. Oh. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop there uh, and answer any questions you might have. Um, because this really is the ministry at Macedonia, even though it's the middle of one of his, his the second missionary trip, it's at this point that Paul reaches Athens, and there's a whole different kind of tone. Because prior to this, he's been dealing primarily with Jews. He's been dealing with Gentiles who are God-fearing Gentiles. When Paul gets to Athens, we have the wonderful event of Mars Hill, which is the... Uh, the place where various philosophers and thinkers, which is right at the foot of the Acropolis, which is where the Parthenon and everything is, there is, it's literally a big rock, and it's, it's flat on top, and that's where the philosophers and thinkers in, in uh, Athens would gather, because philosophy was everybody's favorite hobby. And they would argue philosophies and discuss them, etc., etc., and Paul goes there and presents the Christian faith to them as a philosopher, not as a Jewish uh, rabbi, but as a philosopher. So we pick up a very different tone in Athens and Corinth. So we're going to pick that up next time. We're actually a little bit early. I, I thought, I was thinking I had some more than this, but, um, but I don't. Any questions about any of that, John? Just a comment. Um, we, I've been meeting with some folks who have been doing First Thessalonians for a while, and we're impressed with at, just after three weeks with these people the affect, the love that Paul has towards these people. Oh, yeah. it's, it's not like, you know, I'm going to come and do a two-week revival, you know, and then I'm going to leave and we'll stay in touch with email. It's, there's a real, real connection of his heart with these people, which um, 
when you look at how he traveled and the things that he suffered, there was a, there was an immense love that, yes. that went from his heart to the Yeah, I mean, he really did feel like these were his children anyways. Now, in Thessalonica, he goes there, he preaches, there are converts, and then Paul has to leave because of the persecution. And so, and they didn't have, these are Gentiles, uh, unless they could have gotten a, a handwritten copy, because everything was a handwritten copy back then, of the Septuagint that they could read. They didn't have scripture. Um, they, they didn't have any teachers. This is one of the reasons he left Paul and Silas behind in Berea. So that, and then later on he sent, uh, or, I'm sorry, Timothy and, and Silas. And later on he sent Timothy back to Thessalonica. Paul was really concerned because the persecution that started in Thessalonica when he was there continued against the church in Thessalonica, the church that he had just planted after he left. And so they're undergoing persecution. It's also true, again, they don't have scripture, they don't have anybody teaching them, they get misled with some false doctrine. If you read First and Second Thessalonians, one of the things, especially in Second Thessalonians, deals with the issue that somebody had told the church in Thessalonica, Jesus had already come back and you missed him. And so this, this is talking about, uh, Paul is trying to straighten that out. He wrote the, the first letter of Thessalonians, and apparently had just sent that off when he heard, got word back from somebody that they'd been told that Jesus has come back, and they're really worried because they thought they missed him, and what do they do now? And so he wrote the second Thessalonians, uh, the second Thessalonians right away in order to address that problem. And so uh, there's a strong theme there about um, what's going to happen in the future, and part of that is to provide hope for young Christians with not a lot of training, not a lot of leadership, as they're having to deal with persecution. And so there are a number of beautiful passages in Thessalonians about um, dying in the Lord. You know, in fact, I, I quote Thessalonians often in memorial services because there's very powerful statements in there about the hope that we experience and the realization that, that when we die, that we are in Christ. Um, and so it's very, they're, very, they're great books, not very long, but uh, the whole scenario is these are Christians who don't have a lot of support, who are being persecuted. Paul had to leave them all of a sudden. And he loves them. Clearly, he expresses his love. I think he also feels a little guilt because, you know, you know, not guilt in terms of there's nothing else he could have done, but the sense in which these poor people, you know, they're really left hanging out there. And so he's trying to encourage them with his letters. Lynn first, and then. You have traveled in that area. Did you notice or um, were you told that the present day people have, still have a great deal of respect and love for Paul? Um, they do in Greece. Yeah, they um, do in Malta also. Um, yeah. Anything to do with Paul and the churches um, really uh, doesn't matter who the patron saint is or anything. They really yeah. uh, talk about Paul. And that's true. Even Turkey is 98% Islamic now, although it's a secular Islam. You know, it's, it's not, you don't get the this, this sense of uh, oppressiveness that you get in other places. Um, but there are not a lot of active churches, but there are a lot of historic churches. You know, there and everywhere you go, whether it's you know the, um, for instance, there's a church called um, the Church of Cora. Well, what's, the, what's the full name of it? Anyway, there's a church in in the outskirts of Istanbul called uh, something something Cora, C H O R A. I can't remember the rest of it now. And it's astonishing the the murals and the mosaics and everything. And Paul is a dominant theme there. You know, they have. Two of the large mosaics are Paul and Peter. Uh, and so, yeah, Paul and Peter are the foremost of the apostles in terms of the ones most responsible for spreading the gospel. Um, and so you can get a lot of emphasis on Paul wherever you go. Rich? You mentioned that uh, Paul met uh, Luke for the first time in Troas. Mm -hmm. uh, was that uh, Luke's hometown? And uh, how did he become such a believer? Well, before Paul met him. well, we don't know. We don't know if he was a believer before Paul met him. Um, he, it may have been his meeting with Paul that converted him, for all we know. Uh, so we don't have a lot of history. We do know that he was a Gentile. We know that he was a doctor uh, because of things Paul mentions him several times in his letters. You know, Luke doesn't tell us himself about that. He says who he is. You know that he's Luke and he's writing into dedication to Theophilus and whatnot. But. Um, but Paul tells us in several times, you know, my dear friend, you know, Luke the physician. Um, and so we have that. We don't know any more than that. Now, there were believers in other places. Not, they, there's, there's an indication that Paul was the first one taking the gospel into this part of Thrace and Macedonia. But after the, uh, the diaspora of the, 
Well, first, after the day of Pentecost, when these Jews who became Christians went back to wherever they were from, and that included parts of Asia Minor and uh, Rome, for instance, then they would have shared the gospel. And that's why we later have Priscilla and Aquila, for instance, coming from Rome, and they're already believers. That's why we get Apollos coming from, from uh, Alexandria very early, and he's already a believer. Apparently the message was taken out. And then secondly, during the first persecution, uh, the diaspora, the spreading out of the Hellenistic Christians, Jewish Christians, from Jerusalem, when Saul started persecuting them, and everybody took off, you had a spreading out of the, of the gospel message then. And so you do find, it's possible, I don't know, and I'm not aware of anything in Scripture that tells us, I may just have missed something, that Luke was a believer before he met Paul. Um, if he was, I don't know the story. And uh, the indication may have been that when he met Paul in Troas, he heard the gospel from him, came to be a believer, decided to travel with him. And then he wrote the gospel of, of Luke and the book of Acts later. You know, he didn't do that right away. Uh, we believe he probably, when, when Luke, when Paul was imprisoned in Caesarea, I mean, later on he's going to get arrested in Jerusalem and then taken up to Caesarea and held in prison for two years before he gets transported to Rome. We believe that that two years may have been when Luke had time to go and interview everybody and talk, because he says, he, I talked to everybody. Luke is the only one who tells us what was on Mary's heart. Well, how did he know that? He asked her. Well, he had two years there when Paul was in prison in Caesarea that he had a chance to meet all these people that he hadn't met before, ask them the questions, get to know them, and record it in the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. So this comes later. Mary? Um, we know that Paul was a tent maker for a time, mm -hmm. but otherwise did he basically have to depend on the hospitality of the places he went, <coughs> and the people that he converted, and they would help him and get him to the next place? Right, like Lydia, for instance. Lydia said, come and stay at my house, and the implication is, you know, stay here and I'll feed you and everything. Now, Paul was very adamant that he never, he never accepted support from anybody that would have in any way have been a trial to them. He talks about that several times. And he says, I worked for myself. You know, he worked with Priscilla and Aquila, who are also tent makers. That's where the expression a tent making ministry comes from. Paul supported himself by making tents. Now, the, the suggestion he was from, you know, he was well to do, he was well educated, et cetera, et cetera. But um, it's just like, I'm sure for many generations, the wealthy, the, the daughters of wealthy men were told, well, you'll probably never have to work, but it's a good idea to learn to type. Okay, just in case. Well, that probably was a situation like this with Paul. You know, you always learned a skill, something you could fall back on. But Paul, Paul did receive, example being Lydia and others, um, support. But he's adamant that he never did it if there was ever a question as to, it's, he never presented it as an expectation. You have to support me. He never does it when it in any way would be a difficulty for anybody. And he's very clear about all. It was never a burden. Never a burden, exactly. All right? Um, there's a lot of controversy whether or not Paul was ever married. Um, I was told that if you were a Pharisee, that that was one of the... Do, do you know? We don't know. It is true that it would have been very unusual not to be married if you were um, a Jewish male at all, but uh, certainly if you were a Pharisee because they were more rigid. We do know that some of the others were. Uh, Paul tells us that Peter took his wife with him when he traveled in ministry. Uh, so Peter's <coughs> wife accompanied him. Um, so it's not like the apostles were all, you know, all set aside their wives or anything. Um, we don't have any indication of Paul, but there, and we also know that they, he healed Peter's mother-in-law. That's another, another instance. Didn't Paul say that it'd be better to not be married like I am? Like, well, that's true. He did. He absolutely did. Um, I don't know. He could be, could have been, could widowed. been widowed. Or yeah. Something, but, yeah. Um, but he does say later on, I think it'd be better for you if you weren't married, you know, as I am not married. So whether he's married earlier on or not, because if, if, if a Jewish man, he would have been married quite young, if that were the case. Um, but that's it's so that he would have probably been a widow. But we don't know. He simply doesn't tell us. Do we know how old he was during this ministry? Um, I could probably... He was, he was born about the same time as Jesus. Yeah, yeah, he was about the same age as Jesus. So if, for instance, the first missionary journey, um, first missionary journey would have been 46, so he would have been in his mid-40s around that time, um, wow. mid to late 40s. When he started this, um, the suggestion is his death 
Got a little cheat sheet up here. Um, it's before AD 70. Yeah, it's before AD 70 for sure. Um, he's imprisoned, looks like around AD 67 um, during the persecution of Nero. I, I knew it was in the late 60s. 67 is the accepted date. So he, so he might have been 70 years old. Yeah, he could have been six, between 67 and 70. Uh, maybe as much as even 73 mm -hmm. if Jesus, if he was born about the same time as Jesus, and Jesus was born about six. BC, I, yeah. I just read it today, that's why. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I'm expert. Oh, man, I was impressed. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't remember anything longer than 24 hours. <laughs> yes? I thought they laid the coats at the young man's feet and then yeah. the young man's... Oh, that's true. So he was like how, how old would he have been to be a young man? Well, um, he would have been in the early 30s then. Uh, mid 30s. Anybody that's 10 years older than me, that's middle age. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or uh, he would have been mid 30s at that point because this is just you know a very few years after Jesus' death, so mid 30s. Um, not old enough to be a full member of the Sanhedrin. He probably was a, you know, a Advisor. He's the kind of person that sat in the back row of chairs if you're in a big meeting with important people. Uh, but he, he would have been involved in that sort of thing and, and trained. And um, Yeah, but you're right. Anybody 10 years older than us is really old. It's like George Carlin said, anybody who drives slower, slower than me is an idiot. Anybody who drives faster than me is a maniac. I just love that. <laughs> okay, thank you, folks. Have a great week.